On July 7, 2016, Micah Johnson ambushed a group of police officers, killing five and injuring nine others. It's the deadliest incident for U.S. law enforcement since the September 11th attacks. The reason I tell you this, I walked that exact street just hours prior. To think that my family or I could have been shot or even killed is unbearable. See, there was a possibility that I wouldn't be here today, rather six feet underground, slowly rotting. In the world you and I live in today, society is quickly shifting towards a conservative anti-gun bias. In essence, a large and growing portion of America is afraid of guns. Our ancestors were raised in entire communities where firearms were viewed as everyday tools. Parents even raised their children around firearms and BB guns, but today, even the slightest reference of a firearm is viewed as inappropriate material. Major corporations such as Apple and Samsung have even altered the emoji from a revolver to a water gun in order to, the, uh, in order to appeal to these new societal acceptances. We can't ignore the damage criminals are causing, and action must be taken in order to stop the horrors of their violence. But when people do decide to take a stand, they face a government who limits their options of solving the issue. Susanna Hupp, a chiropractor from Texas, experienced this firsthand. She explained how she only carried a firearm every so often because she risked the chance of losing her license to practice. See, at the time, open carry in Texas wasn't legal, so there were substantial consequences she would face if caught. Now, she was posed with a major question. Would she risk her life or her job? Well, one afternoon she, along with a handful of others, risked their lives after a madman drove through the front window of an inn and began executing people where her and her parents were enjoying lunch. She wrote, I used to carry that gun in my purse, but I had taken it out about three months earlier, leaving it in my car because I was concerned about losing my license to practice as a chiropractor. I was afraid that if I got caught, I'd go to jail. So my gun was 100 yards away, completely useless. Now, could I have hit the guy? I've hit much smaller targets at much greater distances. Was I prepared to do it? Absolutely. Could I have missed? Yeah, there's a chance, but the one thing no one can argue with is that it would have changed the odds. 23 people were killed that day, including my parents. She continued to describe everyone in that room as fish in a barrel. They sat there helpless and waited their turn. Unfortunately, the same will happen again and again if we fail to take a stand against it. We face a rising problem of violence in the U.S. as highly influenceable adolescents are initiated into gangs where they ignorantly take part in shootouts, turf wars, and armed robberies. By presenting this speech to you, I aim to persuade you in joining the movement to push for the legalization of concealed carry as a shall issue permit in all 50 states. To start, I will quickly define some key terms and later address the assumptions people make against concealed carry. Moreover, I will illuminate how the government is acting unconstitutionally when it comes to this matter. After that, I'll address the idea that guns don't kill people, people do. Then, I'll bring light to some crucial statistics of gun violence and clarify how crime rates actually decrease once concealed carry laws are passed. And to end, I'll share accounts where a law-abiding citizen properly used their firearm to neutralize a threat. So, before we dive into this loaded topic, <laughs> let me first define a critical term which I will frequently be using throughout my presentation. Now, according to US legal, a firearm or a dangerous weapon is concealed if it is carried in such a manner as to not be discernible by the ordinary observation of a passerby. The use of self-defense is implied and is crucial to the intended meaning. To start off, let's sift through some terms that we hear commonly coming from gun control advocates. In the recent years, anti-gun lobbyists have managed to establish an almost satanic stigma when it comes to firearms especially assault weapons. Yet, they categorize a gun according to whether or not it can penetrate a level two armored vest, which is, standard, which is standard issue for all police officers. 
However, it is also unknown among these same people that your common hunting rifle can do the same amount of damage and worse in most cases. So why are we placing a negative stigma on just some of the weapons that do the same amount of damage? The ignorance doesn't cease there. There are a handful of terms and phrases that are inappropriately thrown around when it comes to attacking the legalization of concealed carry. For example, let's take AR-15. It is commonly believed that the AR stands for assault rifle, whereas it actually means Armalite, the company who originally manufactured the firearm. The 15 is simply the model number in their array of products. See, an accumulation of simple examples like these lead to the quick decay of gun rights in the US. But they don't stop there. A claim that we hear way too often is, oh, we don't need to carry a firearm on us, we can just call the police and they'll take care of the issue. However, first responders cannot be everywhere, at the right place, or at the right time. In fact, for an active shooter dispatch call, the average nationwide response time <clears throat> is three minutes. Those three minutes will determine if you leave alive or in a body bag. But by taking the opportunity and exercising your right to carry a firearm, your odds of surviving that situation have been greatly increased. In one of my interviews with Travis Oki, an ex-police officer, I asked what his opinion was on concealed carry, and he said that there are officers who agree and those who think otherwise. Some are passionate advocates that citizens shouldn't carry a firearm. They pull the let us do our job card. He then went on to explain that at the core of these ill-formed statements was pride. What they said had nothing to do with the reality of the issue we face. Think about it, right? The very same officer who said we shouldn't carry a firearm goes home at the end of the day knowing that he has a better chance to protect his family because he is allowed to carry a firearm. Mr. Oki then went on to explain that, at the, that as an officer, your firearm isn't just a tool for work. Rather, it becomes a part of you, where you can choose to protect a fellow officer, family, or even yourself. He concluded by saying it all just comes down to protection. And many officers agree with this perspective. Retired Houston homicide detective Brian Foster stated, police cannot take care of citizens. They react after the fact. I've spent many years dealing with cadavers. That's right, police almost always react to the situation after the fact. And by then, it's usually too late. But the argument seems to be polarized between anti-gun pacifists and concealed carry advocates, both of whom are in the scary allegations. For example, when analyzing the extravagant claim that the U.S. is acting unconstitutionally by limiting or even restricting our Second Amendment, they are unfortunately telling the truth. Originally in colonial America, gun usership was heavily protected because it was a means of collecting food and later adapted uses of self-defense. The colonists felt oppressed and burdened by the British, so they took up their firearms and fought to defend themselves. Today, while concealed carry is, technically speaking, legal in all 50 states, what matters is the type of permit that each state makes available. There are two types of permits, shall issue and may issue. For shall issue, if I apply and, of course, qualify for a permit, I will most likely receive one. For may issue, the applicant must present an exceptional or urgent reason as to why they would need to carry a firearm. And unfortunately, in most, if not all instances, the applicant will be denied of their request. Hawaii, for example, is a May issue state. While 46 states do allow the carrying of a firearm, all 50 states still haven't legalized the carrying of a firearm as a shall issue permit. While on paper, the six May issue states, Hawaii, California, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, and New York, are actually no issue by practice. This number may appear as minute, but they also make up more than 71 million people. In 2017, that was roughly 22% of the entire US population. 
Now what keeps this 22% of Americans without the ability to defend themselves even when qualified to do so? We keep hearing things like, guns don't kill people, people do. Obviously, guns won't spontaneously murder people on their own. However, they do make the job much easier for the people who use them for those wicked purposes. Unfortunately, and in response to this, the magical solution people believe will solve this issue is tighter gun control. The issue here is that criminals don't get their guns through legal means. They acquire them through straw purchases, corrupt commercial gun dealers, or of course, street deals. Take illegal narcotics, for example. The possession of methamphetamine is illegal and heavily prohibited. Yet, it is also one of the most common illegal narcotics found because no matter how heavily the US prohibits it, there is no possible way to prevent its use entirely. Similarly, if more gun control is implemented, the only people these laws will affect are the law-abiding citizens. Right? Criminals will continue to carry their firearms and inevitably violate these new laws. Additionally, they'll find their efforts at crime substantially easier when they understand that their victims won't have any substantial means of defending themselves, consequently leading to an increase in deaths due to gun violence. Now, seeing that major universities are joining the debate, it's important we take a look at Stanford professors John J. Donahue and his recent arguments. He claimed that crime rates actually rise after concealed carry laws are passed. However, studies show that they actually decrease. Since 1991, when violent crime rates were at their peak, 25 states have voluntarily adopted and initiated concealed carry laws. And as a result, violent crime has plummeted to one of the lowest points in US history. He also said that the citizens who carry a firearm for the purpose of self-defense are actually the very ones who are breaking laws on a daily basis. However, if we take a look at the Crime Prevention Research Center's website, we can clearly see that he is wrong once again. In 2016, only 16 of Louisiana's permit holders were convicted of a felony of any sort. That's just 0.0092%. Let's analyze the most pro-gun state in the US, Texas. They recorded only eight, or 0.00067%. See, the number of permit holders who were convicted of a crime hadn't even make up 1%. <clears throat> when Florida first legalized concealed carry in the 1980s, gun control advocates argued that there would be constant bloodshed in the streets. They predicted that their state would turn into a place like Dodge City, where there were shootouts on every street corner. However, they were completely wrong. Since then, over 200,000 permits have been issued, and only 36 have been revoked due to the improper use of a firearm. According to other statistics, 95% of gunfights take place within 21 feet. So by taking the opportunity to properly train and prepare in case the need arises where you may need to use your firearm, your odds of surviving the situation have been greatly increased. According to statistics, 95% of gunfights take place within 21 feet, right? From 2012 to 2016, there were a recorded 1.04 million firearm-related deaths. There's an estimated 2,000 people who are injured from gunshots each day. There are over 2 million people living with gunshot wounds around the world. Let's take a look at 2018. There's an estimated 50,000 total firearm-related incidents. 330 were deemed mass shootings. 14,000 include 650 children ages 11 and under, as well as an additional 2,700 teens. From 2007 to 2014, murder rates have fallen from 5.6 to 4.2 per 100,000. This shows a significant 25% decrease in murder. At the same time, the number of issued permits soared past 156%. See, the trend is rising, but it's apparently still not enough. There are still dozens of people who cannot legally defend themselves with a the firearm. In the small town of Titusville, Florida, dozens of would-be slain children were saved by the noble actions of a bystander who happened to be carrying his firearm. 
During a back to school event, a man arrived with a weapon and began to fire into the crowded pavilion. Thankfully, before he managed to injure any of the attendees, a local passerby realized what was happening and acted immediately. He drew his firearm, successfully neutralized the threat. Now the shooter was not mortally wounded, but was incapacitated until authorities arrived. See, you could save one life, many lives, or never have to use your firearm at all. But before a carrier even entertains the idea of using their firearm, he or she must understand that with RTC laws comes an inherent amount of responsibility. Not just in the aspect of keeping track of your firearm, but more importantly, one's character. Having a clear and decisive mindset during these intense split-second situations is a critical attribute. There's nothing casual about carrying a gun out in public. A gun at home, the owner may have it primarily for hunting or recreational uses. But out in public, therein lies an explicit understanding that the owner has the ability to kill someone whom he feels threatened by. Right? We need to work to reduce not just gun crime, but rather all crime in the US. And the solution is right in front of us. We need to look at the problem realistically and not idealistically. We need to develop plans that work under the circumstances of a perfect, we need to develop plans that work effectively and not under the circumstances of a perfect world. It's neither realistic nor effective in redu it's not, gun control is neither realistic nor effective in reducing gun crime. Gun control is neither realistic nor effective in reducing gun crime. Uh, it's plain as day that gun control is neither realistic nor effective in reducing gun crime. We've been following the same trends and the conditions have seemingly only gotten worse with the more gun control we implement. We need to divert our attention and efforts towards controlling and combating the issue at hand rather than minimizing our means of doing so. The great Albert Einstein once said, the world is a dangerous place to live in not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who do nothing about it. Legalizing concealed carry in all 50 states will greatly increase the odds of survival for the citizens who face these terrible and all too frequent situations. The brutality of crime, drive-bys, and school shootings were not a thing of the past. However, they make up a majority of our future. Thank you.